Good evening and welcome to Voices from the Village. I'm your host tonight, Louis LaFortune. Tonight we're going to be talking about water. Our show is entitled Water, Water Everywhere, borrowing from the great Coleridge poem. Um, and tonight we're going to talk about specifically Santa Cruz County and the water situation here in the county. As all of you know, we are in the middle of a historic drought. And so how is Santa Cruz County coping with this drought and with this um, unprecedented shortness, shortfall of, of water supply. There, are, there have been many solutions proposed and, and some of them have been uh, sort of shot down or put on the back burner, but new, new alternatives have been proposed also. So we're moving forward as a county. Tonight to discuss this big topic uh, that affects us all is a, an expert crew, expert uh, panel rather, um, I'm going to start off across the table from myself. This is Bruce Van Allen. He is the co-chair of Santa Cruz Desal, Desal Alternatives. Thanks, Louis. Welcome, Bruce. Yeah. Uh, Doug Engfer is a member of the Santa Cruz, Wa Santa Cruz City Water Supply Advisory Committee. And thanks for joining us, Doug. Thanks for having me here. And Ron Duncan is the interim general manager of the SoCal Creek Water District. Thank and you. again, thank you for being here. So. Let's, um, we're going to talk about this, this whole big thing and what, the, what your committee has uh, advised, because you've made a lot of recommendations. Um, <clears throat> but we want to talk, a lot of this has to do with the difference between surface water, the water that falls from the sky and is in ponds and lakes and rivers, and then the water that is stored underground, which we oddly enough call groundwater. So, <laughs> Bruce, I know you wanted to, um, we're going to show a clip here, and we want, Bruce is going to introduce us for well, us. This is a, a really significant thing, is that um, part of the, there are two crises in water in Santa Cruz County. One of them has to do with groundwater being depleted from too many wells, and so that's something we're trying to face. And the other one is, is the supply of the water agencies, especially Santa Cruz, that depend on rainwater, and that's a problem during a drought, and the two things actually are fitting together, and we'll try to describe that tonight, but the key to it is what is groundwater, and something amazing has happened this year that puts this in a, in a really big context, and so 2015 has, it's already kind of an odd year, you know, the Mets won the pennant, you know, Beijing is talking to Taiwan, um, the, um, an open socialist is running for president as a mainstream candidate, but let me tell you, the most significant revolutionary thing happening in California in 2015 is that California finally has groundwater regulation. This is amazing and this has been a long time coming and it is hugely significant and we're the last state in the union to adopt serious groundwater regulation. Texas beat us across the finish line. Texas. Texas. Uh, Disappointing. So uh, Not a proud place for us. And what that meant was people could pump uh, an aquifer basically dry and there was no consequence, and now you can't do that. Okay, and we will talk about the problems of, of pumping aquifers dry and why that's such a disastrous thing to do uh, for many reasons. But first, we're going to show you this film. This is sort of a groundwater 101 type of film. It's gonna give us an introduction into the, the phenomenon of groundwater, what it is, how it works, and um, what you should all know about it. So let's roll that clip, please. We all know the earth is full of water, but there's a lot more to water than all that blue stuff you see on the globe. The water we can see on the surface of the earth is surface water. Surface water is every lake, pond, river, stream, and ocean on earth. 
But in the ground below your feet, there's even more water, groundwater. Groundwater is water that's crammed in the tiny gaps between rocks, soils, and sediments under the ground. A full body of groundwater is called an aquifer. There are huge aquifers all across America. The biggest is the High Plains Aquifer, which covers 174,000 square miles right in the middle of the country. Anything that big deserves a closer look. Let's say you could grab a shovel and dig straight down through the soils to an aquifer. The level underground where you first hit groundwater is called the water table. Below the water table, the ground is completely soaked or saturated with water, which is why this area is called the saturated zone. The area above the water table is called the unsaturated zone. So, how does all this water end up in the ground? Well, it's all a part of the good old water cycle. When it rains, some water gets soaked up by plants. Some water runs off the soil and into streams, lakes, or even the ocean. Other water gets stuck on the surface and eventually evaporates back into the air. Meanwhile, some of the lucky water droplets get to travel down through the surface deep underground until they reach the water table and become a part of an aquifer. Once water seeps down deep enough into the ground, it can stay there for a really long time. Some of the water stored in the deepest parts of aquifers has been there for thousands of years. But after it gets there, groundwater doesn't always stay in the ground. A lot of the water on the surface comes from aquifers. If the surface of the ground dips below the water table, groundwater flows out into the space, creating a body of surface water. If the surface water dries up, groundwater can flow in to fill it back up. And if the water table in this area rises, so does the level of the surface water. Groundwater can also pour down a sloping surface, creating streams. Any place where groundwater flows out into the surface is called a spring. Surface water can also become groundwater. If a body of surface water flows above the water table, water can seep down through the sediment and help fill the aquifer. Of course, there's another way that groundwater can leave the ground. Us. Humans depend on groundwater, and there are thousands of wells all over the country that draw water out of aquifers. In many parts of the country, the water you get from the tap comes from the ground. However, we use most of our groundwater to help grow the food we eat. Farms can get lots of the water they need from rain, but rain isn't always enough. And in dry years, farmers depend even more on the water that's stored in the ground. In fact, American farms use about 53 billion gallons of groundwater every day. That's enough to fill over a million bathtubs or 80,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. So, if we're using that much every day, can it run out? Well, yes and no. Remember, aquifers can be refilled by rainwater or surface water seeping in from rivers and streams, so there's usually more water on its way to replenish the aquifer. But if we use groundwater faster than the aquifers can refill, we could drain them dry. They probably wouldn't be empty forever, but it would take hundreds of years for the largest aquifers to get back to healthy levels. Whether it's up here or down there, water and how we use it matters. We may not be able to see it every day, but groundwater makes our lives possible. So don't let show-offs like rushing rivers and roaring oceans get all the attention. Those unseen aquifers below ground have been here longer than we have, and with a little love and care, they'll keep on taking care of us long into the future. So a film from, uh, looks like it was from Quest, that would be KQED's educational component. 
um, about about groundwater, defining what it is and how how it gets there, how it is formed, and then the the, the other thing about how farmers typically um, agriculture uses the vast majority of water in this certainly in the state, probably in the country, um, how they take it out of the ground to water their crops. And we learned in the video that the rainfall helps to recharge the groundwaters. Groundwater in our aquifer, the structure underneath the, the ground is called an aquifer that holds water. Uh, and, and, that's, and this is the, the water cycle, part of the, wa the water cycle we all learned about in grade school. What, but it's been raining, all right? It's rained today. It rained about a week ago. It's an El Nino year, we're all hearing. And so it's, you know, what's the problem? Why, with all this projected water, even though it has been a, what, six, seven year drought, whatever it is, um, is, this, is this rainfall or any amount of rainfall going to solve this, this problem that we're talking about? What is the big problem? It's really important to, to see the picture that the problems faced by the Santa Cruz water system, which is the city of Santa Cruz and a lot of live oak in the mid-county, and the problems of the Soquel Creek Water District, which Ron is manager of, um, are long-term problems. They were long-term coming, and they will be long-term in, in so solving. And the current drought makes them more obvious and, and exacerbates the issues and increases the risks for us and, and leads us to need to conserve. But the problems that actually really need to be dealt with here are not uniquely in Santa Cruz, but, but all over the state, are long-term, how do you have sustainable water supply that doesn't keep depleting the groundwater down or leaving us vulnerable to, to drought years. So that's really, that's the, the really important thing. So from that perspective, it's easy to understand in a way or to accept, I guess, because we know we're on a long-term process to rebuild these things, um, to accept that this little bit of rain is nice, but it's not going to make much difference. It's certainly not going to solve the water crisis. Um, and an El Nino winter could cause more mudslides and floods and damage on the cost side than the benefit on an increased water uh, recharge. But let me, let me see if the others want to say anything. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the situation between Soquel and Santa Cruz are, are quite different. Santa Cruz, which is where I focus most of my time, relies about 95% uh, for about 95% of its supply on surface water. Uh, the river, the streams up, up north coast, and ultimately what fills Loch Lomond is also surface water. We, we get a little bit of groundwater, but not much. Uh, our structural issue is that we don't have enough storage to get us through the long dry spells, and we end up in these sort of, um, uh, these drought conditions and these curtailments that we'd have been in recently. Uh, Ron can talk about Soquel, but conversely, They've got uh, primarily groundwater supplies, and as we've heard, our aquifers are, are deeply overdrafted. Um, what we came to as a solution with the Water Supply Advisory Committee actually helps solve both problems uh, in that we're looking to be able to recharge the aquifers using excess river flows uh, in the wintertime when it's, when it's raining. Okay. Yeah. So, so Santa Cruz, just to restate, Santa Cruz relies mostly on rainfall and river water, right, right from our, our San Lorenzo River. Um, the largest reservoir is the uh, Loch Lomond, Loch Lomond Reservoir, right? right? Um, I hear there's talk about maybe perhaps building something else to supplement that. No? That was no. considered and dropped in this process. Oh, considered and dropped. Right. Um, there are also smaller reservoirs around this county, though. Is that correct? North Coast water? Uh, no, not no, the city no. of Santa Cruz. It's Loch Lomond. It's Loch Call Lomond. it 3 billion yeah. gallons, a little yeah. bit less, okay. and that's it. Okay. So and that supplies about a third of our water well, they, typical and year. In the, in the winter, the co the, it comes from the river because there's an abundance. Mm -hmm. And in, in the summer, we draw from Loch Lomond. The river actually supplies year-round most years. We've been drawing out of the river uh, much of the year this year. And mm -hmm. Loch Lomond's kind of our bank account. If you think of the river as a paycheck, then the Loch Lomond's the bank account that we rely on when the paycheck comes up a little bit short. Right. So that's the Santa Cruz situation. Right. right. So with Soquel, so Creek. with Soquel Creek, we're totally groundwater. That's water beneath the surface in what we call aquifers. And we've been over pumping Soquel Creek and other pumpers uh, in the basin have been over pumping that basin since the 80s. So uh, I have a graph here that shows red and yellow on it. Maybe it could be shown. And it shows the red being what we've over pumped and the yellow what we need to save in the future. Um, so even if it rained many years in a row, we still wouldn't be able to pay, uh, make up what we've overpumped in the past. And on top of that, 
uh, climate change is predicted to reduce uh, recharge into the aquifers by 30%. So it's bad, and it's wor looking worse into the future. Okay. So what's so this very forward thinking? I don't know. You know, Santa. I've lived in Santa Cruz County for many years, and I'm always impressed at the just the brain trust that exists in this county. People come up against a very difficult solution. I mean, problem, and smart people figure it out. And so it sounds like this Water Supply Advisory Committee uh, has come up with some terrific recommendations to deal with these, right? The the shortfall in um, in SoCal Creek, which is chronic, pretty much, and the uh, and the abundance, the winter abundance in Santa Cruz. So talk about how how is that going to work? Right. The recommendations we put together um, will deliver uh, water security for Santa Cruz and quite likely for our, for our partners, our regional partners, in 10 years. Um, it was a, a, a fabulous process. It took about 18 months. Of, it was uh, a smart group of people, too. You're I, right I, about that. <laughs> <laughs> Myself excluded. I'm, um, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. I'm, I mean, I'm always impressed. Yeah, a number of, uh, there were 14 uh, folks who volunteered uh, to serve on the committee, representing a wide range of interests from town. And I think most stunningly, really, uh, we agreed on a consensus-based decision model and pursued that throughout. Um, and I would suggest we succeeded because folks, um, as they entered the room, checked their positions, checked their agendas at the door. They brought their interests, their perspective on, on what the, the community really needed, uh, put the community's interests first, and, and came up with a solution that um, allows us, again, to uh, make better use of the water that flow in the San Lorenzo most every year, uh, store them in uh, aquifers in the Parisima, Santa Margarita, other aquifers in the area in collaboration with Soquel Creek and with Scotts Valley, and then use that uh, as uh, dry weather storage. A bigger um, bank account. Right. Um, and ultimately, essentially double the amount of storage that the, that the town has. Uh, we need to be able to put about another, the equivalent of about another Loch Lomond's worth of water back in the ground and be able to get that back out. And that gets us through um, what we project as worst year dry spells, uh, even after climate change, uh, and leaving water in the river for the fish. Uh, so it's good for everybody. The, this is really extremely significant that, that, that this group reached a consensus on such an important thing because water supply is a really fundamental. It's one of the most fundamental things that local government does or local agencies do. And um, to have water come out of the tap that's healthy and clean and available is, is one of the great things about our life, and, and it's essential, and it could fail so easily. It's very vulnerable, actually, um, and takes a lot of hard work and effort to keep it there. And so to have a solution evolve of about such an important thing, I rank this as, as um, significant as a community decision of grappling with a hard problem as the post-earthquake downtown recovery plan that Santa Cruz had to do, where we had to have the property owners and the business people and the environmentalists and the neighborhood people and the firefighters and police and you know, all the different parts of the community get together and actually get consensus on that plan. And that turned out to be very successful. Um, and the, having the breadth of support in the community is a lot of why, that, why it was able to be implemented. And that's to me why having a consensus in the Water Supply Advisory Committee as opposed to just some group winning by you know, eight to six or something like that um, and, and imposing on everybody else what their idea of a solution is that would not necessarily then lead to the community to support the endurance and investment and work that it's going to take to put any system into place. So to me, this is extremely significant as a, a constructive community decision that, that, that we reached here. Um, and I could say more about some of the milestones along the way, but um, I, I, well, I'm kind of curious what the others think about that. Well, let's, let that me piece just stop you there for yeah. a second. And <clears throat> this is a live program. Uh, we are uh, here in community television. We have a telephone line, so we invite calls from our viewers. Our phone number is 425-8844, extension 30. So please, I'm sorry, 8848, 425-8848, uh, extension 30. And so please, please give us a call here if you have a question for one of our uh, panel. We're discussing water and water use and uh, issues here in Santa Cruz County. The, um, so yeah, let's talk about the history of this. Now this, a lot of this got our attention, I mean me, the general public, 
when the whole desal, uh, there was this proposal to build a desalination plant here in Santa Cruz County. Yeah. Um, and at first, there seemed to be quite a bit of support from that for, for from uh, the city council at that time, and they were supporting it. And now, um, and then this movement grew up, and you were part of that, Bruce, um, of Santa Cruz Desal Alternatives. So you and other people, significantly, uh, Rick Lancinati and other people, created this. So I guess sort of a, a group to look at this whole idea of desal and think, well, is this a good idea? If not, then what else can we do? So talk about the whole history of desal here. Well, you know, Santa Cruz has a long tradition of um, uh, really trying to seriously make sure that things that are proposed for development or changes here fit fit the natural terrain, fit the what the community's values are, and it was. Um, probably not that unusual for our people in our community to start wondering about the idea of a, of a very expensive, highly energy consuming, in a sense, big factory to take seawater and turn it into drinking water. And um, so as the desal proposal, which again, you know, that came about because some, some people working hard in good faith trying to solve a hard problem, a challenge of water supply, came up with what they thought was the best solution. and did their work and convinced people that that was the way to go. So I don't fault them for that. But what it turned out is that their solution had a lot of problems with it, too. And so I'm going um, to interrupt you. Yeah, there, that's Bruce. how our movement got started. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, we do have a phone call. Hello, you are on the air. This is Voices from the Village. Yes, thank you. This is Anastasia here at Santa Cruz. And I would like to ask the panel, what are they doing to restrict uh, the courses. What? S say again, what are they doing to restrict what? Uh, the golf courses. Okay, golf courses. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, um, can you take your answer on the air, ma'am? Golf courses? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes right. I, I got it. The golf courses. Right. Okay. I'll, I have a comment. I'll, I'll, I can start out a little bit with in terms yeah. of what's gone on with yeah. the committee. Yeah in the context of the committee's recommendations. Oh, um, one of the key uh, components of us being able to solve the problem was having a better understanding of demand in town. I can talk about this more later on in terms of the, um, uh, the work we did there. But one component of that was that uh, Pasa Tiempo was making the assumption, the expectation that Pasa Tiempo is going to be relying on um, recycled water uh, delivered from Scotts Valley which reduces uh, their load on the Santa Cruz water system pretty substantially, uh, several hundred million gallons a year. I'll just say, as, as a non-golfer, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but I consider golf courses to be a huge waste of water. And it's, I think it's a bigger problem in Palm Springs than in Santa Cruz County, but um, they take a lot of water. So to me, it's, it's got to be one of those things that um, uh, have to be, we have to look at what's the culture that we're continuing to live in and reproduce in this particular place. Does, does what, does our lifestyle fit this place? And, you know, I, but again, I understand that people love golf and it's a, it's a fresh air recreation thing that, that has a lot of aesthetic value for people and I understand that. But, okay, Carl, I hope that answered your question. In more or less, I would like to have I would like to see restrictions on these people. We do not need these golf courses. Okay. All right. We'll we'll, uh, so I'm we'll, with you. <laughs> we'll have our panel address that. Thank yeah. you for your call. Yeah. My understanding is that De La Viega's cut their water use uh, to about 30 percent of what it was you know, uh, pre-drought. So they they so cut De La Viega, which is the city owned city of one, course, correct, uh, has cut by. I think what, down, 70%? I think down? they've cut, yeah, well more than half. Okay. You know, they're not watering the fairways and so forth. I'm not a golfer, but I run up there. Mm -hmm. and, and what we opened with was the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. That's requiring the basins to come into uh, sustainability. It's, it's quite a few years out, 2040. But by virtue of that, golf courses and other large pumpers, private pumpers, are having to send their pumping information into the Department of Water Resources and show a reduction. So either recycle or just reduce. So there is some action being taken and more, and we're working as a community, all the agencies together right now, to, to pull in the other large pumpers and help them reduce. You know, that it might be worth saying a little more about that groundwater agency that we sort of alluded to earlier, because the pumping, 
that's one of the most significant things. Um, as Ron said earlier, people are allowed to pump up till now with no regulation. They don't even have to have meters on their pumps or report how much they're taking. And um, uh, that's then there are some large um, institutional um, pumpers, right? There, there are. I mean, it was a passage of uh, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in 2014 by Jerry Brown, and as you guys alluded to, probably one of the biggest things in California water law ever, especially at least since the, the surface water laws. So in 2015, that legislation was enacted. In 2000, by 2017, in June, we have to form a, an agency, a groundwater sustainability agency, and so that, and the private pumpers will be involved with that. They're already working with us. So two, year, two and a half years after that, we have to have a plan together that says this is how we're going to do it, and then 20 years after that, we have to have a sustainable basin, otherwise the state may come in and, and take over. And so, a sustainable basin means it's not depleting any further? Right. You're not taking, down, taking out more than is being put into uh -huh. it. So good yeah. question. Thank you. So um, let's talk about that for a minute. What are the, I, I worked for 10 years in Watsonville, and, and so I was always paying attention to the local news. And, mm. and I learned about this phenomenon of the, the saltwater intrusion mm -hmm. into the, uh, the valley. So the Pajaro River Valley is well known, wide, world famous, because that's where everybody's strawberries come from, right? Uh, world famous for its strawberry production. But, and other crops, but um, a big problem of that is that we have the farmers, again, drawing water out of the ground, taking it, the aquifer is, is being dried, being emptied, and this, yeah. it, and the aquifer has a, another uh, function, right? It has this, this pressure that keeps the salt water, which is also underground, right. uh, from coming in from the ocean and making the aquifer salty. And so the salty ground, salty groundwater it's no good for growing anything. You can't drink it, right? So a huge problem down there in, in, uh, in the Pajaro River Valley. So um, you are dealing with saltwater intrusion in, so in Soquel Creek. We are. You know, it's in most populated regions of the world. Uh, saltwater intrusion has happened where they use groundwater. So I think on slide seven, we show a, a seawater intrusion, what it looks like. So you pump water down too much, and if you're connected to the ocean, it kind of comes in subsurfacely. It basically ruins your aquifer forever. So, oh, forever. So yeah. there's no reparation there's no for that. Back. They call it a tragedy of the, of the commons kind of thing. Yeah. And there's another slide, slide eight, that shows uh, two red dots in our area where we have seawater intrusion uh, already. Now, if you go down to Pajaro Valley, that seawater intrusion's in three miles. Mm. If you go down to Carmel, it's into almost Highway 101. Not Highway 1, but 101. So this isn't a figment of our imagination. This is happening as we talk in the Soquel region and further south. Now, this is the kind of beauty of the, of the proposal from the WASAC to, to try to solve their problem and help ours. I must caveat it that Soquel uh, is also pursuing other options to purify water, uh, recycled water, to take uh, sewage water, purify it, and inject it back in the ground, and, and, and also looking at what you guys have coming. And the reason being for that, we feel we owe it to the customers, our board does, because you're, the plan they're looking at, you know, it has stages that, and they have to test, and we can't wait that long, we don't feel. We see it already at both ends of our district, seawater intrusion, and if it uh, hits the coast in the middle, it's only two years to a production well. So we feel like we have to run these options in parallel, the purified uh, recycled water. We have a feasibility study going on already. And then we have sent a uh, Santa Cruz letter saying, our board has saying, hey, we're interested also uh, in what you have to offer too. And this year we are, we're really test flying we yeah. uh, water transfers. Uh, this very winter, yeah. An agreement, um, I guess, getting in place right. between Santa Cruz and Soquel, whereby if there are sufficient river flows this year, we'll send uh, up to about 100 million gallons your way right. using existing infrastructure. Um, it tests the concept uh, to an extent. It's a relatively small amount of water, but it's a start. Um, I think almost more importantly, it's the start of rebuilding the relationship between Santa Cruz and Soquel after um, the challenges we've, uh, we've come across <laughs> since the desal project uh, went south. Mm -hmm. um, I think Santa Cruz realizes we have to, we have to re-earn the trust of our partners in the area. Yeah. So you, you mentioned 100 million gallons as a mm -hmm. sort of pilot this, mm -hmm. this winter. Mm -hmm. What, 
when it's fully implemented, what would that number be like? Is that like 5% of the total, or what is that? Um, th fully implemented, we should be able to send, uh, it's going to be, we haven't engineered it just yeah, okay. yet. Uh, in term, and so uh, I couldn't really tell you exactly what the volumes would be uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the limit. Um, if we could send you know, four to five million gallons a day uh, down there, we'd not only be able to cover the water use uh, for, for SoCal in sort of an in-lieu mode where we supply potable drinking water and SoCal can, or Scotts Valley can then rest their wells, which mm -hmm. allows the aquifer to cover. We could also inject water uh, as well, um, so-called aquifer storage and recovery with injection wells uh, to the extent that we're able to deliver more water than, um, than SoCal can drink. Uh, and if we had that whole system in place, yeah. the, so, the amount of water, the quantity of water was, the estimates that I'm familiar with are way more than we need for, way, the, okay. for the worst case drought. There's that's what of, the potential is for. Yeah. Well, if, there's plenty of potential storage. Storage, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, right. that's about 12 billion gallons of overdrafted capacity. And I mentioned before, we need about 3 billion in, in the bank, 3 mm -hmm. additional billion in the bank in order to get Santa Cruz through what we project to be the worst case scenario in the future. We'll keep filling it, right? Because it's good for everybody. It's good for the streams. Take uh, surface water, put it over to SoCal or Scotts Valley and push it into the ground. Right, right. The injection stuff, it's good for the seawater intrusion. It's good for the environment. It's, it's good uh, for our boreal sense. health. Uh, which will help us get through climate change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to say a little more about that, unless you were ready to uh, go, no, go Go for it. So the, one of the things that, um, there was a very significant meeting in April, which is when some of the um, uh, consultants revealed both the, the possible storage capacity in the aquifers around the county and also the huge amount of extra water available in the winter, winter from the river. And the two kind of things kind of went together and went, whoa, there's a solution. Well, one of the spin-off sort of side benefits of this solution for human water supply for our districts is benefits to the habitat, to the natural environment. Because those aquifers are down, but once they come back up, and it even kind of illustrated it in that, in that little video um, animation, um, uh, once the aquifers get back, and it's not going to be right away, it won't be this year, next year, but maybe 10, 15 years out, when they get back to near their full capacity, what those aquifers do is feed all the local streams that are downstream from them. And so, for example, if we can make a deal and start restoring an aquifer, the big aquifer in Scotts Valley, there's a couple creeks that come down from there, like Bean Creek comes down. It's a big tributary to the San Lorenzo. Mm -hmm. If the aquifer is refilled, Bean Creek will have a much higher what they call base flow, which is the kind of the average flow, not during storms, but like during the summer. That base flow is crucial for the stream habitat. So, so, the, so let me understand this. This is where we have uh, springs, correct? Springs so, are exactly the same thing. They're fed by the underground aquifers. The, the springs are fed by, yeah, I, I was always, yeah. as a kid, I was yeah. always like, how does a spring work? Why is yeah. there water coming out of the ground? Yeah. But that's, that's groundwater it's at that pressure. level, yeah. right. and it's being pushed out by pressure. Yeah. And, so gravity. Much, and gravity. And gravity. Yeah. And there's so much water. So it would uh, re rejuvenate then probably many of these springs that have dried up. From the, the, from the dropping water table and just the flows in the streams because a lot of, some of the groundwater just flows right straight to the you know an existing stream channel so so but the significance of that is more water means the fish are healthier the in stream habitat flushes out better which it needs to do so that there is the right spawning habitat for example for the big fish um, the the little bugs and stuff that live on the stream bed are better off with more flow the plants around the birds the 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 food chains that surround you know, from the area between the banks of the river, those are crucial for habitat all over the forests of our county. And with more water flow, there's nothing more that could help those habitats than more water. And so, to me, the fact that we have solved a very difficult political and engineering problem, or have the idea to solve it, um, with this new plan, that it has this incredible habitat benefit means this is the one that we really got to do. This is, this is the right plan for Santa Cruz. And, and to Ron's point, and to uh, really kind of complete the thought, we would focused a lot on the aquifer storage component, which is the, the primary strategy uh, for, for the city of Santa Cruz, uh, from the recommendations of the Water Supply Advisory Committee. But there are two other primary uh, strategic elements of the plan, yeah. uh, one of which is continued conservation, not yeah. like the curtailments we're seeing today, but um, continued conservation uh, in line with the kind of stuff that Santa Cruz has been doing historically. 
Uh, to Where it's uh, kind of built in, not like sacrifice, but just common right. sense built right. into the way we do the plumbing and everything else. Right, a lot of that is you know, swapping out appliances, uh, rainwater catchment, and that sort of thing. Uh, and that solves about 20 to 25% of the gap. Um, we expect that the aquifer storage uh, will, will supply the rest of it. If there's any remaining gap, uh, and if, or if in some respects the aquifer storage strategy just doesn't pan out quite the way we projected, we do have a fallback plan, which, not dissimilar from, from Soquel's, uh, would rely on either uh, recycled water um, or, as a, as a last-ditch fallback, desalination. Um, so again, the, the point here is that the, the plan and, and the roadmap attendant on the plan uh, really does provide water security for the city of Santa Cruz, um, uh, like I said, within about 10 years, and it will solve the problem for generations, one way or another. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now, it sounds like pipes already exist between your Some. district there is. and the Santa Some. Cruz Water District. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's so right. So you you're going to start this winter moving water from uh, the San Lorenzo? Yeah. Uh, it's from the north coast, actually. Yeah. That's, oh, it's, okay. It, there's a pre-1914 water law allows us to do that. We, uh, so there's, yeah, there's a way to, to so make things happen a little faster. We'll continue that. there. Let's take this call. Welcome, caller. You are on the air. This is Voices from the Village. You have a question for our panelists? Yes. <clears throat> I'd like to bring to their attention a study that was done by the public utilities not too long ago, which entailed drawing water from beneath San Lorenzo River in the wintertime. Now, that, that solution was totally debunked because uh, the end result would be <clears throat> lower water streams in the summertime. Now, any more watershed robbery in the wintertime from San Lorenzo River watershed will result in lower water streams. So my question is, <clears throat> is there anybody on this Water Advisory Council who are educated and certified in 21st, water, 21st century water science technology? Uh, um, that's my first question. The second is, do they realize that you don't infuse untreated river water into aquifers? Okay. All right. Thank you. So, I can uh, so caller, if, if I may, I'm going to um, end the connection here, and you can take the answer on the air. Okay. Thank you very much. Is that all right? All right. Thank you for your call. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think I can, I can at least start a conversation about this, and then and Bruce and Ron uh, can jump in. Um, the, in general, um, I, I'd want to uh, communicate that the committee was well supported uh, with a technical team of experts. Uh, you know, we're, we were generally civilians um, on the uh, on the committee, uh, but we were supported by technical staff uh, that included uh, hydrologists, hydrogeologists, uh, economists uh, who were working on the demand side, um, and both. Um, and folks who are deeply familiar with the local hydrology and, uh, and the local systems. Um, as regards the flows of the San Lorenzo, uh, an average year flow in the San Lorenzo is about 30 billion gallons over the course of the year. We use about three. Um, so um, there's, there's plenty of water in the river t in, in the wintertime uh, to allow for the kinds of flows to storage that we're talking about. Uh, and, and still allow plenty of water for the fish. Uh, we did this under the, we modeled our um, recommendations under the most restrictive fish flow requirements that, that we could foresee being, um, being asked to comply with, and those are the ones from the state of California. Um, the city and the state are still in negotiation about this, so from a, um, it was a conservative assumption in terms of how the modeling was done. Uh, so we assume higher fish flows than might otherwise have be, been assumed. Um, as regards uh, the uh, groundwater injection, as I think I mentioned previously, you know, we would be sending potable water for injection. It would be going through uh, the Graham Hill water treatment plant before it would be injected. There are some differences about how it's, um, how it's treated before it goes into the ground because you don't want to create uh, chemical reactions in the soil. Uh, so it's not the same water that you'd get out of your tap. Uh, it may not be chlorinated, for example. 
uh, but it would be treated to potable standards before it'd be injected. And then once it's extracted, it would be treated again before anybody drank it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So his, his first point, I think, <clears throat> was concern that, de that uh, taking water out of the river in the winter would, would affect the summer flows. That doesn't make yeah, sense. No. We, yeah, no. And ultimately, if we get those aquifers recharged, then storing that water will probably right. As you said, if you incrementally you know, is raising the water flows. table yeah. generally is going yeah. to benefit yeah. the, yeah. the uh, streams year round. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a real good point. Some creeks yeah. went dry this summer. Now, the, the one other thing that was a piece of what, what the caller mentioned was the idea of, of pulling water from the river from something that a facility that's underneath the river. And there are um, types yeah. of ways of collecting water. And that, that are a, a, a collection devices installed under the stream so it's not in the water, doesn't obstruct the flow, and it is able to pull water up without as much mud and sediment and silt in it during the high flows. And so um, th that, that may be, that's something the city's going to study as a possible way to draw winter water because then if there's less silt and sediment in the water as it's drawn out of the river, there's less treatment of that to get that out of the water before it's moved on. So. That is a possibility, yeah. but it's, it's one of several ways. The, this plan is uh, at the level of, of realistic but conceptual things to do, and there's got to be tests and studies, tests about yeah. what happens chemically when you take water from one basin and then mix it with water from another where the soils are different. There could be chemical reactions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got to find that out, and we've got to do the right thing. If, up it's right. bad news. Okay. Yeah, there's a kind of a universal, not, well, California law that do no harm. So whatever you inject in has to be of the quality or higher quality of the, than the receiving water. And surface water is generally a little more what we call aggressive than groundwater. So it can, you know, that's that chemical reaction that Doug and Bruce are referring to. So we'll investigate that and hopefully yeah. get a little bit of a taste for that with this small transfer right. that we have going. So that's the big value of that. Yeah. All right. Uh, again, thank you, Carl, for your, for your call. And I'm just going to give out that phone number one more time if you wish to call. Uh, we're discussing water issues in Santa Cruz County this evening. Uh, the number is 425-8848, extension 30. So please, we welcome your calls here. Um, <clears throat> so we talked about the groundwater. We talked about moving water. And there's already pipes in place. So you're going to start this winter moving water from Santa Cruz from the not, not the San Lorenzo, as you corrected me, from the uh, northern coast. Northern coast. Uh, that, right. That's the plan. That's uh, the plan. There, there is a, uh, we have an agreement in place signed by the city council and the Soquel Creek Water District Board, so that's, that's huge. You know, it's a real, it yeah. there's a lot of positives going on here, and maybe we can end with that because there's, <laughs> okay. you know, it's been a long road. But, um, but there is, uh, we got to make sure there are no negative environmental impacts, so we're, we're going through that process mm -hmm. right now. So it'll probably be the, I'm thinking about March when that happens, so we're trying to catch the tail end of this rainy season right now I see. with that rainwater. One of, the, one of the considerations that's an interesting one for the city is that people in the city have been on rationing for a while or have been on curtailment. And the water director said, no way am I sending water to anybody else if the people of Santa Cruz are right. still curtailed. So, right. mm -hmm. so, but we're looking, that's been lifted, I think, as yes. of last week or something yeah. like that, so that yeah. Santa Cruz is not on rationing anymore. Yeah, there are a number of conditions right. that relate to right. whether the transfers happen and if yeah. so, how much. Yeah. Uh, to, your, uh, to further your point, the existing infrastructure allows for a certain amount of certain volume uh, to be able to be transferred to SoCal. It would not be sufficient for the full system That's that we've talked right. about. So that would mean new pipes uh, to SoCal, uh, even just for the new in wells lieu to component. Yeah. For the injection, there'll be wells and then pipes associated with that. Um, if we're able to collaborate similarly with Scotts Valley, we don't have inter existing interties between Santa Cruz and Scotts Valley. So that would be new construction, uh, new pipeline construction. So. Um, but you're, you're talking to, Santa, to uh, Scotts Valley Water District. Yeah, Rosemary and Perrette um, yeah. talk okay. regularly. Yeah. And, and we hope to be able to collaborate with everybody because there's, there, again, there's to, plenty of water. To bring, so, the, so you mentioned the three districts, so those are the three. Yeah. yeah. Plus the county kind of has a hand in it and yeah. an interest in it. And they did some of the key research, mm -hmm. too, yeah. um, that actually helped us. But those are the three districts that we do it. So. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so we're talking. So let's go. Let's go now to this legislation, if we could. So last year, was it? Yeah, 2014. So Jerry Brown signed this uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and finally California comes into the 21st century <laughs> in terms of uh, dealing with its uh, chronic water problems. Um, and 
this is going to mandate the creation of these sustainable groundwater sustainable agencies what are yeah. they called yeah yeah they're groundwater sustainability agencies they may have unique names but that's the overarching name which you have to form so there will be a number of these throughout the state of california there would be yes if you look down the central valley of california almost every base in there is what they call in critical overdraft and matter of fact the department of water resources has uh, renamed our basin now in critical overdraft from oh, medium really? to critical. Oh. Yeah, we got a groundwater emergency, and recently they did that. So uh, they recognize the seawater intrusion, the, the nature of what's going on. Um, so uh, we're coming together to uh, solve that. There's a committee that's been meeting. If we if the, went to slide 10, there's kind of a picture of, uh, you know, we got city, two people from the city council on there. Mm -hmm. uh, two board of supervisors that are on that committee, a couple uh, board uh, directors from Soquel Creek and Central Water District and supporting staff. So, and uh, a very important component are the private well pumpers, and that goes to the county. Yeah. They pump probably, I don't know, 20% roughly uh, out of the basin, so, and they want to have a, a hand in how this is shaped too, so. And that district is for the Purissima Aquifer, we're, which we're is the, the mid-county one? We're having to submit a boundary, and, that, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a great point. So I'm gonna mention uh, December 10th, I believe, mm -hmm. from seven to nine, um, at the Community Foundation. December 10th or, no, or November? No, December 10th, December there's 10th. a Community Foundation, okay. uh, a meeting at the Community Foundation from seven to nine that uh, invites everybody to come participate in that and they'll be setting the boundaries or you know, uh -huh. showing what we got made for that. Yeah. So it includes part of Santa Cruz, Soquel, mm -hmm. uh, and... And, and then there's, a, as I understand, a similar one being established in the Scotts Valley Basin yeah. area, which probably has maybe the San Lorenzo Valley Water District and Scotts Valley. That's you know, correct. There's one in San Lorenzo Valley and one in Pajaro, so we're all yeah. communicating and our um, boundaries will be up against each other. And the Department of Water Resources wants to see that coordination so everybody's not just going out and doing their own thing. It's okay. an interesting thing politically because city boundaries and county boundaries, you know, they're, they're drawn for all kinds of reasons, most of which have nothing to do with, yeah. it may be mountain ranges to find boundaries or sometimes rivers do or coastlines, but underground aquifers, yeah. Yeah, we don't see them, so the boundaries don't correspond. Mm -hmm. So if we were gonna set up local government based on the aquifers, based on the, in a sense, a more natural way of thinking about our region, you know, than in what it's got for us that supports us, then we'd have very different boundaries of our cities and, you know, we, and so this is almost establishing that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, you know, the law is doing it on a state level. I think locally here, because we don't receive any export water or import water, we, we're, we on, we're on our own. Yeah. You know, we gotta, we create the problem, we gotta solve the problem. And the, uh, what they've done on a state level is just say, hey, we can't just keep pumping these aquifers. We've got to uh, make water available for you know, your children, your grandchildren, and that sort of thing, because we've been just over pumping them. And we've recognized that locally uh, and you know, been making efforts to, to do that ourselves. So we, we're a little bit ahead. Actually, the, the state has given us grant money and they've come and watched us, our groundwater sustainability agency that we're developing. We're kind of the model, and I think we're proud of that. Uh, we're leading the charge on that. Yeah, and this is a critical factor uh, as regards the collaboration uh, between our, our two areas, as in the context of the aquifer storage. Because I mean, as you can see, there is sort of a moral hazard issue here to the extent that there are private pumpers who are completely unregulated and not uh, not being managed in any way, um, taking advantage of you know the water that we might Good. collectively mm -hmm. be uh, mm -hmm. restoring into into that aquifer. So the notion that everybody's going to be a responsible participant in this common good is a good thing. Yeah. Okay. Great. Very, very politically charged, though. I mean, you know, it's, in sure. California, this is if you want to see pitchforks, you know, and tar and feather get meetings, just call an issue about water. And <laughs> As they say, you know, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. Right? Water's for fighting. <laughs> yes, we've heard that one. Um, <clears throat> we didn't measure mention. Measure P, I know this is more related to the desal thing, but well, I think it's significant to, to measure P? get into that, that when the desal project that the Santa Cruz was proposing and it was a, a regional partnership with the SoCal District to share that desal water at times, um, uh, um, as that went forward, um, our, our group got organized desal alternatives and began raising a lot of questions about it, cost, energy consumption, where is it going to be located, water quality impacts on the ocean, things like that. And um, 
uh, the city went ahead and did an environmental impact report for it, or a draft environmental impact report. We analyzed it. It had terrific problems, and, and especially dealing with the, the uh, energy consumption of the, of the desal plant. And so we mounted enough concern. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped a step there. The, the we, before the EIR, um, what we said is that we weren't sure that we were um, going to get due consideration for our concerns. And so we organized a ballot initiative to, um, that succeeded in gathering signatures with a really hard work of a bunch of people to put on the ballot the proposition that if Santa Cruz were to actually move ahead to develop a desal plant, the people of Santa Cruz had to vote on it first. And so, um, and that passed 72%, passed all across town um, in, in 2012. Um, and, um, so that was Measure P. That was Measure P. And, and that was passage guaranteed that the people would get to vote on yeah, desal. Yeah, so it wasn't itself pro or con on desal, no, but right. the, the impetus the, from the it came pro from the concerns. Is what yeah, it pro was. democracy, big decision for the community, everybody ought to be able to participate in it. And, mm -hmm. So given that, then when the EIR came out and we began identifying so many problems and the, the state and federal agencies that were going to have to improve, approve the EIR also raised terrific problems with it um, about impacts, um, environmental impacts. Um, and a very significant thing happened that we feel the community organizing we had been doing, the passage of Measure P and the critique that came from all over all directions um, of the EIR that led to a very significant moment, and the, the leader of the city at the time deserves huge credit for this, and that was Mayor Hillary Bryant, mm -hmm. who was pro desal and was accepting the, the momentum towards desal, but said, whoa, the community is really rising up about this. We need to pause the desal discussion and pull back and have a bigger look at this again. And that was what led to the formation of the Water Supply Advisory right. Committee right. and this incredible out of Santa Cruz goodwill and intelligence and consensus building that brought us to this solution. So it's the people of Santa Cruz in many ways who deserve the credit to raise the que have raised the questions and then voted to say, wait a minute, this is a too big a deal to leave to some experts or you know, vested interests or whatever their picture was. Um, and I'm proud of the people of Santa Cruz for that. Um, it's been a total privilege to be part of this kind of a movement. Okay. Yes. No, it was, it was a great... Uh, a great exercise in, in bottom-up, you know, from the grassroots sort of democracy. I, I was impressed. Uh, Fish, let, um, one of the things I heard recently, last couple of years, was that the California Department of Fish and Game has mandated a certain amount of river flow, water flow in the river. Doug mentioned that so, a minute ago, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, and it's, talk no. about that and how does that impact this whole thing? Well, one of the key, there were two key assumptions we had to deal with that um, were, were drivers of uncertainty uh, as we were trying to put together our, our recommendations. One is climate change. We've talked a little bit about that. I think we all recognize it's going to get hotter and drier over time. And then the other uh, relates to the habitat flows or the fish flows that um, we're going to be required to um, allow in our streams. And it's not just the San Lorenzo, but it also affects the North yeah. Coast streams, the Laguna uh, Creek, and so forth. Um, and the city is in ongoing negotiations with the state and has been for 20 some odd years. Long, long time. Um, in order to try to set those flows. It's, it's very complicated in terms of how much water flows when based on um, uh, weather conditions and water temperature and, and a lot of other factors. Migration cycles uh, of the fish. Right, right. Um, but the, the bottom line is that there are, you know, there are a couple of numbers. Um, uh, I alluded to uh, previously these, uh, uh, the state's proposal, which is referred to as DFG-5. I guess it's Department of Fish and Wildlife now, but, um, but that's here. And then the city's proposal is here. And the final answer is going to be somewhere in that range, mm -hmm. right, once the city and the state come to agreement on this. But um, that's fundamentally, it's, it's kind of critical to getting this thing done. It's also critical to giving us an opportunity to be able to uh, completely perfect and, and, and perhaps improve some of the city's water rights uh, on the San Lorenzo River to give us some more flexibility about where that water can go. As Ron mentioned before, we're going to be delivering North Coast water to Soquel initially. Uh, initially, we'd like to be able to deliver San Lorenzo water, and that's going to take a little bit of work in the water rights. And, and all this stuff is, is intertwined. All of it goes to ensuring the best habitat possible 
in the ribbon streams for all the reasons that, that Bruce indicated earlier. And, and let me add to that. Um, you know, I know uh, SoCal Creek Water District and the city pitch in money for, to help the county do a study every couple of years. And uh, Kristen Kettleson and John Ricker and that bunch from the county uh, and John... Um, Mr. Alley came and, and Don they, Alley. Yeah. Don Alley, Don. and presented their data. And what was astounding this last time was, uh, and I won't have the numbers exactly right, but I'll, I'll, I'll give the flavor of it. They've been in, you know, let's say 10 years back, you know, found 1,000 baby fish, you know, five years ago, 500. And then, you know, it went down and like last year it was like two or three in their sampling. So mm -hmm. it is a, a serious issue and we're talking, you know, endangered species here. So, and I think this community cares about it. Um, its streams and its, and its biota, you know, especially these endangered species. So. It was one of the core values of the committee. Is mm -hmm. one of, when we did set our agendas aside and talked about what mattered to us and what we felt mattered to the city, tops on everybody's list yeah. uh, was the environment. Yeah, they have no way to, to, to vote, you know. No. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to let our conscience help us do that. Yeah. So, yeah, and enough fish. And, of course, we want to preserve our natural habitat. But also it's an economic issue as well. You know, there used to be a significant... Yeah. Salmon and steelhead and whatever uh, flow of fishery here mm -hmm. in San Lorenzo River, and there I've seen fo historic photos. Yeah. Oh yeah, fishermen lining the banks, yeah. and it would be nice to have that back again. Yeah. You know, yeah. as for many for many reasons. Right. Um, I think we're nearing the end of our time here. Final final thought, Bruce. Well, um, let me just say again what. what the thing I was saying a minute ago, which is that we are at this point because the people of Santa Cruz, in effect, rose up and um, expressed their disagreement with some of their elected leaders and got everybody's attention and insisted that a, a better look be made at, at water supply decisions that are so important. And so this is definitely a case where um, uh, it's, it's uh, the popular will and, the, and the, the people being willing to step up and participate in the political process has been the crucial thing. Um, and so that's the first thing, that people can make a difference when they care about the environment and get involved in their local community. Um, and we've seen that as a, uh, we've seen breakdowns, but we've now had a good example of when we didn't have a breakdown, but we got a great apparent success. So that, that's really the main thing I want to say is that I just, I love the people of Santa Cruz for caring so much. Okay. I think that's going to do it. I oh. see we're rolling credits, so I'm <laughs> sorry, gentlemen. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Okay. And we'll see you again next time on Voices from the Village. Good night. <laughs>